This is the best server uptime monitoring software I've ever seen. It's super simple, it just looks beautiful, and you can use it to monitor all the things in your home lab. From web UIs and applications to devices and databases, DNS servers, yeah, even Docker containers. It's absolutely amazing. Today I'll show you how I'm using uptime Kuma to monitor all the different types of services in my home lab and how I've set up notifications that send messages to my Discord. So whenever one of my services is down, I'll get a message to go and fix all the mess in my home lab. And that will probably happen a couple of times here because, let's be honest, my home lab is always pretty chaotic and something is always broken. But hey, at least I now get notified about it. This video is supported by Teleport, a free and open source access proxy that helps you to securely authenticate to all your IT infrastructure like Linux servers, databases, Kubernetes clusters, web applications or remote desktop. You can easily protect your accounts with modern security features such as two-factor authentication or a passwordless login and access your services through the browser or the CLI tool with audit logging and session recording. And the best, it's completely free in the community version so you can just download and run it in your entire home lab. Or if you'd like to use it in your company, Teleport offers many professional features like auditing, single sign-on and more. It's a great tool, so just check it out. You will find a link to their website in the description of this video. Okay, so let's get started with Uptime Kuma. This is a free and open source Uptime Monitor application. If you want to learn more about it, you can find this repository on GitHub. Of course, I will leave you a link in the description down below. And this is really an amazing project and it is super simple to set up. I'm currently running it on my production Kubernetes cluster where I have deployed it using Argo CD and protected it with trusted SSL certificates using Cert Manager and Traffic Ingress. That is a pretty reliable and secure setup. Up. But of course, you don't need to make it that complicated if you don't like. You can actually just deploy this with a very simple Docker Compose file, just like this here on your home server. You don't even need to set up or connect a database for it. You just need to make sure that you're using a persistent volume where Uptime Kuma stores its data and expose it on your network using the port 3001. Alternatively, you could of course also use a reverse proxy, something like Traffic or Nginx Proxy Manager to make it accessible with HTTPS and trusted SSL certificates. That would be much more secure. By the way, if you are interested in learning how to install it in Kubernetes or how to use tools like Docker, Traffic and so on, I've made so many videos about these topics in the past, so just check out my channel. And by the way, just speaking about it, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. That would be great. You can also check out my other free resources on GitHub like my templates, cheat sheets and write-ups. Of course, you will find all of that in the description down below below. That should help you to install Uptime Kuma in your home lab and once you got it up and running you can simply connect to the web UI on port 3001 and set up a username and password. And that's basically all you need as I said. It's pretty simple to deploy. And the first impression I had once I logged into Uptime Kuma was, man, this is such a beautiful web interface. It's very clean and minimalistic, and it gives you all the data and statistics that you wanna see without distracting you or overcomplicating things. That absolutely fits my style. It also has a dark mode, which you should always activate immediately, because real IT guys just like us, we need dark mode. On the left side, you can create and view all the monitors that you have configured in Uptime Kuma and on the top right corner you can directly see how many of them are currently up and running. You can by the way even take down monitors for plant maintenance so that's pretty useful if you're hosting any service websites. One thing that I also really like is it always shows you a detailed history of activity logs and keeps track of all the events. As you can see the way it works is it simply sends out requests to all the different monitors to check whether they are responding or not and you can set up these requests for different types of protocols and services such as HTTPS, TCP ports, ping, DNS, Docker and so many more. I'd like to show you a couple of things here and how I'm monitoring these different types of services in my home lab because this is where Uptime Kuma really stands out and it should probably help you to configure it for your home lab as well. The monitoring type that I'm using the most and I'm pretty sure most of you will use it as well is HTTP or HTTPS. 
GPS. And this can be used to monitor any type of website or application that has a web interface, such as Portana or firewalls, switches or home lab dashboards. This here, for instance, this is a configuration for my Portana uptime monitor. You can see I've configured this as an HTTPS monitor type. Of course, you need to provide a URL where Uptime Kuma sends the heartbeat requests to, which could be an IP address or a DNS name, depending on how you connect to your services internally. I'm always using DNS names that my local DNS server resolves to internal IP addresses, but that of course might be different in your setup. You can also configure other details here, such as the heartbeat interval, so that is the frequency of the requests that Uptime Kuma sends out to this URL. Note, it should be something between 20 and 60 seconds, not more or less, because it would either produce an unnecessary amount of network traffic or take too long until a not responding monitor is considered down. And you should also allow at least one heartbeat retry, because I found out sometimes the server or the application might respond too slow or run into a timeout, and then you don't want Uptime Kuma to immediately send out a notification. So by setting the retries to one at least, which is the default, Uptime Kuma will try to reach out any service once again after it went into a timeout, and only if the service doesn't respond to both heartbeats, you will receive a notification. That's pretty useful. You can also monitor the health of your HTTPS certificates by enabling a certificate expiry notification. I would always activate that when you're using HTTPS because this makes sure when you are managing your own trusted certificates, you get notified before they expire. Uh, for instance, uh, there might be an issue on your reverse proxy like an API token that has expired or something like that. In this case, you can get notified by Uptime Kuma to take care of this before it becomes an issue to the client. But also, if you're not using any trusted certificates in your home lab, for example, some of my networking devices such as the Sophos Switch or the Sophos Firewall, they don't have the ability to use Let's Encrypt certificates. That's where you would see a certificate warning in your browser once you connect to them. And on these monitors, you just need to enable the ignore TLS SSL error for HTTPS websites to make this working. So as you can see, this is all pretty straightforward and self-explaining. However, uh, what might be also interesting are the HTTP status codes that you can configure in here. That's the response code that a web service will send back to its client request to say if it's all good or hey, you need to authenticate first. And as you can see, by default, Uptime Kuma only considers status codes from 200 to 299 as a valid response. That is especially useful if you're running applications behind a reverse proxy such as traffic, because if the application is down, but the reverse proxy is still up and running, you would get back a 404 from traffic, that means not found. And Uptime Kuma would recognize, okay, so this is technically still a valid HTTP code response, but because it is not in the accepted status code, it would still be considered a down monitor and it would send out a notification. So this is really amazing because with that, you can can monitor all web applications even when they are deployed behind reverse proxies, like I'm using this setup in my home lab all the time. And I can still get notified about any problems with these applications itself, even though the reverse proxy is up and running. By the way, because we are just speaking about notifications, this is what you should always set up for Uptime Kuma, because how would you know that there's something going wrong without being notified? You can set up and enable different types of notifications for each monitor individually. For example, I've configured just one notification that should be sent out to my internal Discord. There I have just provided a Discord webhook URL. So when Uptime Kuma considers one or more monitors as down, you will get a notification message in the Discord channel where you have added this webhook to. This is how a message would look like. It always sends out the service name and also the time and the specific specific error message that it got from the service. And then it's time for you to fix the problem in your home lab. Yes, this is the part that we always enjoy the most fixing problems, especially when it's happening on the weekend. But anyway, once the monitor is up and running again, Uptime Kuma will also send out another message telling us, okay, it's all good again. Okay, so this is how I've configured like 90% of my home lab services and applications in Uptime Kuma, because most of them have a web interface that I can monitor with HTTP or HTTPS. But there are of course other monitor types that you might be using in your home lab. For example, if you're running a database that you want to monitor such as MariaDB, 
MongoDB or MySQL, it is a bit different because usually databases don't have a web interface where you could send out an HTTPS request to. So that's why I'm monitoring my database services with a TCP monitor type. This will basically just send out a TCP request to initialize a handshake with a service on any open configured port. As you should know, MySQL or MariaDB listens on port 3306. So you just need to add a host name to this monitor, which can be again an IP address or a DNS name and the correct TCP port. That's what you should use for monitoring any type of application that is not HTTP, but has a port that you can connect to, such as databases, a Minecraft server, or anything like that. It's also worth mentioning that you can even monitor specific databases on a database server. In this case, you would need to set the monitor type to MySQL slash MariaDB, and then you can provide a connection string with a specific query that you want to make on the database server. Again, this is not for monitoring the database server itself, yeah, but for specific objects inside a database. However, I haven't really found that any useful to me because if a database object is not accessible, it's most likely the database server itself that has a problem and that you can easily monitor with a simple TCP monitor type. So just like I've shown you before. And that's what I think is the best instead of adding every single database in here, just add one monitor for the entire database server itself and then you're good. There are other situations where I wanted to go a bit more specific than just monitoring TCP or HTTP. For example, when I'm monitoring my internal DNS server, because I wanted to get notified when my local DNS resolving is not working, and when I now would try to monitor this with a ping or a TCP monitor, that would just check whether the server itself is up and running, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's responding to DNS queries. That's the reason why I'm monitoring my internal DNS server with a DNS monitor type to check if the actual service is functional. Here you need to add the IP address of your resolver server, which is then the internal DNS server, and the port 53 for DNS. And then you can query any resource record types for the given hostname, like monitoring the name server or a mail server record. In my case, I thought it just makes the most sense to query the name server itself with an A record, because if that works, most likely anything else on this DNS server will work as well. And for those of you who will now say, why the hell make this so complicated? You could just simply send out a ping to the DNS server IP to see if it's up and running. I will show you a quick example why you should do it this way. Let's assume I make a mistake in my DNS config file. Yeah, for example, I always forget these semicolons here behind the brackets because let's be honest, it's a complete and utter mess to configure bind. And when this happens and I restart the DNS servers, you can see the DNS server itself is still up and running, so it would always respond to pings or TCP requests, but it's not resolving any DNS queries. And this is what Uptime Kuma will monitor with a DNS monitor type, and it will only send out a notification when the DNS query is not resolved. So these are all great ways to monitor or any kind of responding services in your home lab like DNS, TCP or HTTP, anything that you can send a network request to. But what if you'd like to monitor a specific application that doesn't have an open interface or port? Maybe you are running a Docker container such as Cloudflare Tunnels or a Portainer agent and those types of containers, they don't accept any incoming connections from outside the containers network at all. But I have some good news for you because you can still monitor them in Uptime Kuma. Note, this only works when monitoring containers on the same Docker servers where Uptime Kuma is deployed. But if you want to do that, you just need to change your Docker Compose file a little and pass the Docker socket as the volume mount into the Uptime Kuma's container. Then you just need to set up a Docker host in Uptime Kuma. This is where you simply just select the connection type socket and leave the rest by default. And then you can add new monitors with the type Docker container for any workloads that don't have a web interface or connection port. Uptime Kuma will directly use the Docker API, just like Portainer or the Docker CLI does, to check whether your containers are up and running. So when the container is stopped because it has an issue or it's simply not restarted, you will get a notification. I know, technically, you can also connect to the Docker socket of a remote server with Uptime Kuma using the HTTPS connection. But to be honest, the way how it is configured in Uptime Kuma is a bit confusing and it's not documented very well. For example, I haven't 
found a way yet to add a proper TLS authentication and validation here. And because of that, I'm not using it in my production home lab yet. But I think it is extremely useful for any home lab that is just running a single Docker server. And then you can add monitors for all the containers that don't respond to any TCP or HTTP requests. You can still get notified when there is a problem with them. So that's it about Uptime Kuma. I know it has a couple of other interesting features, but that was the most important stuff I wanted to show you about my setup. I think this is freaking amazing. If you haven't used Uptime Kuma before, then go and check it out. Because for me personally, this is really the best system to monitor all the things in my home lab. But what do you think about it? Just leave me a comment below. As always, thank you so much for watching. I will catch you in the next video and take care. Bye bye.